Welcome everybody back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY of the City University here in Manhattan. My name is Sir Frank, Frank Henschke. I'm running the Siegel um, Theater Center. Now we have been uh, uh, running these talks for uh, 10 weeks. We are hearing from artists around the world, around the globe, um, about their experiences in the time of Corona and uh, what, how they are um, uh, thinking, what they, it's on their mind how what we experience is, is changing and whether it's an authentic change and about theater, what will it do to theater, what has it already done and what will happen to that art form we are working in and uh, it is uh, uncertain uh, what is happening. Uh, we live in great times of uncertainty. We do not know what will happen normally we do. And it's a difference, especially in the Western world and the European or in the North American one, but all of a sudden we are sharing what the whole world perhaps uh, has shared for a much, much longer time that we do not know what it is that lives can end uh, uh, based on a handshake uh, that uh, um, uh, medical and health conditions do matter, that uh, reactions from our government really, really matter. And, um, and in the US, we have this catastrophic situation, not only the pandemic uh, lay open the, uh, uh, this disaster, um, one of the highest numbers um, in the world, especially, of course, in New York City, where we have 5 million people going in and out of the subway every day and almost a million coming out and in from uh, Penn Station um, and uh, Grand Central. So um, everything that makes our city great works in the moment against that. And we have to see what will happen. Stores are closed, theaters are closed, businesses are closed. Over a quarter, if not more, of the American population is out of work. Um, it's an unprecedented situation. The first curfew since World War II has been announced and on the streets for very, very good reason is anger, uproar, and, um, and an expression of rage against conditions we have been living with or accepted perhaps for, for too long. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, something we all uh, have to think about. And yesterday we had three Israeli playwrights and George and so Bals, the great writer said, you know, it is encouraging to know that a life does count, that it does matter. And I would like to share a statement that came out from the public theater. Um, Oscar Eustace also was here with us. He actually also had the COVID virus and spent a night in the hallways in the Brooklyn hospital, not knowing if he would survive, but uh, here is the statement uh, a bit adapted. So um, the murders of George Floyd Amoud Arbery, Tony McDade, and Breonna Taylor have demonstrated in horrific fashion the racism upon which our country was built. We mourn the loss of these black women and men, and we are grieved and outraged by their death. Theater is for, by, and of the people, yet it has taken us far too long to proclaim that simple truth, black lives matter. We must stand in solidarity with the black artists, black staff members, the black community and all communities of color. We must do more, much more to fight the racism that infects every institution in the country, us at City University included. We must recognize that this is a time of change and that we have to be part of the change we want to see and we have to be part of the fight for that change. We need to live up to our own ideals. We ourselves have to change in an authentic way. Um, next week, we have uh, a, a lineup uh, with uh, New York uh, artists, mostly normally we, it's one out of the five uh, days uh, is uh, from the US, and, uh, but still we had the new Black Fest here and, uh, and many others uh, uh, before Giordano de la Cruz and, uh, and, and others. So next week we have Jonathan McCrory from the National Black Theater and uh, Ngozi Anyanwu. James Scraps and Tamula Woodard. We have uh, in between the great philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy from France who will join us and maybe he will be able also to give us some thoughts to create meaning. Then we have Nigel Smith from the Great Flea Theater and Woody King who has run the new Federal Theater for over 50 years. So um, it's going to be an, an important week of reflection 
just to mention it, we also got a post from a New York actor who, about our Siegel talks. And he said, who cares about this, about your talks right now? People are dying. Be part of the conversation about justice. And basically saying we should stop. In one way, he's right. It's true, but it's also not true. And he's wrong. We do need to care, and we have listened to our friends and colleagues from uh, Hong Kong, speaking of uprisings in Haiti, Brazil, Lebanon, South Africa, the shootings of demonstrators in Chile, the police beatings of Roma and uh, Romania, and also their struggle is our struggle. And actually America should turn away from isolation, away from nationalism, and it is perhaps also part of the problem. It is not right to think what happens here counts so much more than around the world. And because we do listen to our colleagues in Lebanon, Egypt, and Brazil, we have even more reason to be really outraged at the murder of George Floyd. There's universal injustice out there over centuries. It's a war. And perhaps war is more the given situation than the peace. But America is no exception to it. And it really should be. America should be an exception. It should not be here. And America itself is not uh, living up to that uh, promise it offers. Um, we uh, talked also to Ralph Pena from the Asian American uh, Maya Theater Company uh, this week. So we felt it is important to keep up um, our um, conversations. But it is true for centuries, the Black community has suffered much more than others in this country. And it is happening again in this moment. Not only the coronavirus kills them, so does the radical and racial politics in the US. Social and economic inequities, including poor access to healthcare, discrimination in healthcare settings, greater reliance on public transportation, higher numbers in healthcare jobs and service industries, and differences in employment and the level of employment so are all leading factors why the numbers of death in the Black community is so, so much higher than in the white community. And we have a president who refuses to wear a mask like everybody else. He suggests we should inject ourselves with disinfectant. He is hiding in the White House in a bunker when there seems to be a, a protest outside. And he suggests that the US military that is there to protect American people from harm, and he is supposed to protect American people from harm. He is uh, suggesting that they should shoot at protesters. And he's holding up a Bible in front of a church uh, after police clears way for him uh, through really peaceful protesters. It's outrageous. It has to stop. He has been called a mass murderer because of his uh, failed politics uh, here on that program. And, um, and I think uh, it is time to change. This needs to change. And I think also it will change. And we in our theater and performance community have to look hard what role theater and the arts can play, should play and will play in the real, the symbolic and the imaginary. And we need to see how artists in other countries are dealing with civil uprising, the refugee crisis, authoritarian regimes, censorship and police killings in Egypt, Lebanon, Cuba, Brazil. And it's important to find out how South Africa, for example, in the years of apartheid, how did artists like Basil Jones and others how did the market theater, how did they react? What did they do? What worked and what role did uh, theater play? Um, and uh, how did they contribute to change? And what we're hearing, they really, really did contribute to change. They were a focus of it. And this also will and should be the case here in America. One of the countries uh, also very much in the headlines, perhaps a little bit more out, but coming back uh, to it is Greece, um, the geographical, uh, uh, nearness you know, to, the, to African and also Arab countries where the refugee crisis or because of political situation is so uh, uh, dire, so disastrous. Greece has gone through a lot, uh, uh, not only financial uh, history of it, but also struggling with adapting into the European Union, but also it's a country that gave us uh, uh, an idea of theater everybody still talks about. We all learn about, we all admire, we think about, even so we don't know enough about it, perhaps it was more Black Athens theater than we thought, Richard Kekner reminded us. And, um, but it is um, a close to the idea of democracy in early forms, the idea of theater as a place in a community, in a society, in a theater that was close to the gods and um, where um, it was part actually of a daily life and perhaps not yet looked at as an, as an art form. 
Um, before we start to talk with Avra uh, Sidiropoulou, and welcome and thank you for, for taking the time to stay with us. I also would remind all our viewers, it's uh, today the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square uprising, the bloody, bloody uprising in 1989, over 30 years ago. It was a bloody Greg town and uh, it, people died, students died, and also the loss of these lives are not forgotten. And uh, you might forbid and censor what's written in ink and online and digitally, but blood cannot be erased, uh, someone said, and that's blood loss, it does count. And, um, and we all remember it. I know that in Hong Kong yesterday, demonstrators were defying orders not to demonstrate. So thousands were on the street in Hong Kong. And um, Hai Fai Wu, who was here from the Penn Theater in Hong Kong, a great theater artist said, you know, we are all worried here what will happen to us, to our free speech. And he says, June 12th will be also a big day there where the protests began a year ago. And, um, and he, they are also struggling how to react as artists. So Avra, um, <clears throat> welcome on our program. How are you, where are you and what time is it? Okay, first of all, thanks very much for having me in this wonderful series. I am very happy to be here, um, to be here at this moment in time and to talk about Greece, uh, my country of origin, and a little bit about Cyprus, which is where I've been residing for the past few years. So basically I'm in Nicosia, Cyprus at the moment, and it's uh, 7, 11 p.m. at the moment. So it's getting uh, progressively dark, um, but the internet is bringing us all together. So it doesn't really matter where anybody is. I feel very much a part of New York and what's going on in the United States at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Are people following in Greece what's happening on the streets in New York? Oh, absolutely. People have been protesting in Greece, uh, especially last night. There was a long protest um, about uh, the uh, killing of George Floyd. And there was a protest that arrived and stopped in front of the U.S. Embassy in Athens. And there were a lot of people involved um, because Greeks are extremely political people and they're all for justice. Uh, we've suffered enough from different um, kinds of crises. Uh, but racism is ever present as a threat in Greece, in Europe, as much as in the United States. It's something that really concerns all of us. So yes, we, we have been following and we've been um, very much uh, trying to, to find a voice to uh, speak about all these problems, all these huge injustices that have been also revealed because of the coronavirus. Somehow this pandemic has exposed many of the inequities that have perennially uh, tortured a great part of the world. Mm -hmm. how, how did it play out in Greece? Tell us a bit. Well, the pandemic, we've been, uh, for a change, we've been lucky enough not to have had a, a big outbreak. I think for the first time, we all Greek citizens felt protected by the state, which took measures very, very fast. As soon as the first surge of um, new cases started in, in Greece, the schools closed down immediately, uh, businesses closed down. Um, we were not allowed to go out at all, just once a day, and we had to text the government to get special permission. Uh, I think they, um, the state handled the whole crisis pretty well, in fact, and they had a good reason to do that because um, as a result of the long financial crisis in Greece, which started in 2009 and went on for about 10 years, actually, the uh, national health system had been extremely weakened. So it was very important to do everything we could to you know, protect uh, the health system from uh, being overwhelmed. And so things went well, I, I should say. We didn't experience the amount of um, uh, outbreak that we saw in Italy or in Spain. And now things have gone back to a, a new normal, which means that schools reopened, businesses have reopened, um, the public transportation is running, and we are trying to, uh, you know, 
get readjusted to this new normal, this new reality, which means we are pretending life has gone back to, to being what it used to be, but uh, also trying to be very careful. We have to wear masks um, and all that. But I'm, I'm grateful for the Greek government for uh, doing a lot to protect the people. And as I said, this is a new thing for us. We, we've normally felt uh, exposed in every big crisis that has occurred in, in Greece so far. Mm -hmm. So, um... <clears throat> You had an early lockdown. So how many weeks were you under lockdown or when did it open up again? Well, um, I was in and I've been in Cyprus since um, March, mid-March when the lockdown occurred, both in Cyprus and in Greece, things kind of happened concurrently. And uh, things have been unlocking, so to speak, in the past couple of weeks. So basically, we had a solid two two months of straight lockdown where nothing could be done and we had to work from home. Our children were at home. It was, it was a difficult time, very challenging. And now, uh, as I said, besides schools and businesses reopening, now the tourism industry, which is a big thing for both Greece and Cyprus, is about to um, restart with whatever this means for the epidemiological uh, fact or whatever that's going to, to do to the health of people, but still um, hotels are opening, um, airports are opening now in next week. Um, so flights to all over the world are resuming. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, how was the atmosphere in Greece during lockdown? What, what was on people's mind? What was on your mind? Huh. Well, the beginning was uh, troubled because there was this pressure to, to do a lot, um, to use the time, to use the time to do research, to use the time to create art, to use the time to you know, see your family. Um, after a while, I realized that I could give myself permission to uh, kind of be lazy and to let my mind detox from the small things of life. So when you see so much pain around you and uh, when the whole world is pretty much collapsing and you talk to your friends in Milan and they tell you that their grandparents are both in hospital with the coronavirus, then you stop worrying so much about failing to, to be perfect. And um, you stop worrying about your image and you know, living up to what is expected of you. And you start being more forgiving of yourself for not delivering, of others for not delivering. So um, I kind of enjoyed that luxury of pause. Um, I felt it was a, a, a good alibi for me to go deeper and to let my mind wander to places that normally I wouldn't have had the time to, to, to wander in. Um, it, it was... Um, very quiet. Everything was extremely quiet. You couldn't hear anything but the sounds of nature and the birds singing. It was. It happened right in the middle of spring, where everything was. Nature was kind of blooming, but there were no cars in the streets, no people out, um, and we were all living together. And for me, that meant uh, being in an apartment with my two, my husband and my two sons one of them being a very moody teenager and the young one, a first grader that I had to uh, homeschool. So that was like uh, another difficulty um, in getting things done. But somehow when you accept the chaos of this, um, the newness of this, um, the temporary quality of that, because you have to you know, think that this will end at some point, then you accept that this is a kind of war. And I kept thinking about my grandparents and my parents even who experienced World War II. Um, what was life back then without the internet, without being able to connect to people, to follow what's going on in other places, to, to know that you're not alone in this, but people are suffering too. So I was practically glued to my computer screen at all times. It became an extension of me. Um, and um, I didn't do much in terms of 
you know, academic writing or the big research that a lot of people said they, they have been doing. But I was following the news, um, reading international papers and talking to people, my friends, my family in Greece, my um, sister in Turkey, uh, my friends all over the world and connecting uh, through the net, which is good. And watching a lot of theater online, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that's how it, um, th that's how the situation was. And now we are, you know, finally able to, to resume our activities and mm -hmm. our lives. So you see a little bit of a light after those times. You talk about dark places, uh, places you normally don't go to. What are those places with you? you know, well, sharing? Once you stop uh, producing, you start imagining and, uh, those dark places are the places of deep emotion that you normally never have time to think about. And you feel very sometimes um, hesitant and embarrassed to express to other people. But now that we're all suffering this very raw, very new, um, you know, global thing, global uh, affliction, there's no reason why we should be so apologetic or so embarrassed. And the dark places are the places of loss and facing your own mortality and knowing that your parents are elderly and who knows what's that going to happen, you know, next. Um, and thinking about your position as an artist and the kind of theater you've been making what you want to do now, which is not necessarily a dark thing, but it is a, a, a spot of reflection and something that you really must acknowledge if, you know, it's right there in your face staring at you, it's the elephant in the room. What do I do from now on to make the world a better place, to make it more just, to help my, you know, audiences, the, the, the theater community, to deal with things that have been left ignored for a long time. So this is the kind of dark that I'm talking about, not necessarily bad dark, but something that is buried underneath a lot of um, inessentials uh, that needs to come to the surface. In theater, um, you said you have to confront what you're doing, what you haven't been doing, what you did right, so what, what, what are your thoughts and uh, what, can, what came to your mind in your Well, I think theater will change. And um, I'm not just talking about the practical aspects of it. We don't know how many seats the theaters are going to be operating with. There's been talk of like a 40% capacity in the theaters or, you know, wherever the aisle seats are going to be and all that. No, uh, I, I think the theater will change and return to the basics which is bodies breathing together in the same space and stories that are um, important for everybody. Universal stories need to be written now. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of uh, you know, visual theater and this is the theater that I've been doing uh, in my own practice and what I really like to watch, but somehow I believe it's no longer about aesthetics. It's no longer about production values. There's got to be something um, that connects audiences and artists on a more um, um, fundamental level. And this is stories and emotions um, being shared. So I think a lot of new plays will be obviously coming out of these very dark times. And perhaps more agonistic practices, more in uh, practices that involve the audiences more. I mean, in Greece, it's been happening over the past 10 years because we have experienced a huge crisis. And as a result of that, a lot of new uh, participatory forms have emerged in Greek theater. Um, and I think theater is moving to that direction, entering the public sphere and no longer staying away from society it's a you know reclaiming the right to ask the big questions unapologetically and you know bring mm -hmm. us face to face with um our responsibilities our civic responsibilities our individual private professional responsibilities 
Yeah, I, perhaps next to uh, Venezuela, Greece uh, was the country the world worried most about uh, financially. Um, and what uh, happens now in the US makes that look like perhaps not as deep a crisis as, uh, as it once was in Greece, but still it was a very surreal uh, financial crisis. You said theater changed already. So what did theater artists do in Greece in, a, in that outlook there will be no jobs, there's no money, uh, it's uncertainty. You said you found new forms. What what happened in Greece? At the, the, back when the financial crisis started, um, there were a lot of new companies, small theater companies emerging, um, and the new forms that uh, that occurred were basically, as I said, participatory and device theater forms. Because um, I think a lot of that had to do with the need to to express. Um, the urgency of the crisis. So new texts had to be uh, kind of devised, uh, made up out of- What uh, were examples, for example, some of the companies or work, where did they go? Well, there was like Bleach Theatre Company in Athens that wrote um, and new pieces and uh, kind of um, worked as a collective that um, put up plays that had to do with the collapse of Europe and the idea of European solidarity being a joke. And that was, they mostly operated back in the um, 2010, 11, 12, which was the peak of the Greek crisis. Um, and then documentary theater became extremely strong, um, addressing the refugee issue. And of course, Greece has been very strongly affected and um, uh, kind of uh, very, I wouldn't say badly, but yeah, very strongly affected by the uh, influx of refugees in the Greek islands. Um, so it was really uh, wonderful to see that rather than turn, um, turn their backs to the theater because of the lack of funding, uh, artists became even more connected to each other, formed new companies and tried to reach out to those underprivileged groups. And a lot of Greek artists like um, Yolanda Markopoulou and um, others have been working with refugees, forming mixed companies with people from Syria and Afghans living um, in, uh, in Athens and putting up shows that tell their stories. Tell us a bit exile. about the work. Tell us a bit about uh, these plays and work. What how did this Greek theater community react to it? Well, the, the most amazing thing for me is that a lot of those stories were uh, staged at the National Theater of Greece. And hmm. this is a huge thing because obviously this is, you know, a reference point for our theater practice. And they got a lot of people got money to actually um, stage plays new Greek plays that were dealing with some aspect of the um, refugee and uh, forced displacement issue. Like a lot of refugees coming to Athens and um, uh, seeking shelter, uh, trying to adjust to um, a difficult life with uh, very little money. And also how the Greek society itself has reacted um, to the new multiculturalism that the, um, kind of became the new identity of Greece. So the National Theatre uh, took on uh, several of these plays as did the Municipal Theatre of Northern Greece, organizing also a series of um, workshops involve, involving people um, from the refugee communities who were able to, to work um, in the theatre and put on um, not necessarily, you know, highly professional, obviously shows, but some uh, examples of their own um, theater making. It reminds me a little bit of Exil Ensemble in uh, the Gorky Theater in Berlin. So actions like those were happening. And also um, what played a very important role was that the Athens Festival, uh, the Athens and Epidaurus Festival to be more exact, was um, um, redefining its mission starting uh, 2010, I think. Uh, when George Lucas, the then artistic director, took over and 
things started having a more international scope. There was an extroversion that Greece needed very much at the time because it was at a very transitional uh, place, trying to redefine its identity with respect to Europe, with respect to the world, and um, trying to, 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 you know, to survive. So what the uh, Athens and Epidaurus Festival did was invite a lot of people from abroad, like uh, Rimini Protocol, um, Milo Rao. They, they came to Greece several times and they put on plays that had to do with the new conditions forming around Europe and the world and uh, political theater in the sense that audiences were no longer kind of um, passive spectators, but became really part of what was going on, asking to have an opinion and uh, be part of the show. Um, also, the Onassis Foundation um, the, that created the big cultural foundation called Stegi, that again put a lot of money into uh, inviting major artists from overseas to come to Greece and um, they either commissioned new plays uh, or they just uh, brought back shows that had been very successful in other parts of the world. And in fact, there is a festival, an annual festival called um, Fast Forward Festival organized by the Stegi at the Onassis Foundation that has a very uh, specific political scope. And um, again, um, I'm trying to think, um, Rimini Protocol, um, uh, Akira Takayama from Japan, a lot of artists that have uh, a new way of seeing theater, not just as a, you know, a storytelling machine, but um, um, an interdisciplinary art that involves different parts, um, different arts and different parts of the world, multicultural um, and theater as a research machine. They, they were coming to Athens and uh, created things that made sense at the moment, at the peak of the Greek crisis. Yeah. That is, uh, that is uh, stunning to hear. And so did you feel that theater, did it make a difference in the life of the city? You talked about the new identity of Greece uh, as it has happened. Did theater make a contribution? Oh, yes. Um, Greeks enjoy theater very much, not back in the ancient, just back in the ancient times, but uh, the Greek audience is a very involved audience and people love to go to the theater. So um, I think it did make a difference because there is a younger generation of um, artists that were coming out of that crisis, uh, that were stuck in Greece with no money or with very little money, with very few jobs. And they created the so-called protest generation of Greece that went out in the streets, collected people, gathered people together and brought them back to the theater to, to watch a different sort of performance. What do you mean they collected people? Well, I mean, a lot of the uh, theater projects actually were site specific projects and other projects were participatory projects. So we, Tell we, us a bit about a specific project. What would uh, be specific mm, here? Let what me they think. did. Well, I mean, Prometheus in Athens, which was Rimini Protocols project mm -hmm. in 2010 um, uh, gathered about 100 Athenian citizens um, trying to represent as many um, parts of the Athenian society as possible, including illegal immigrants, um, and brought them on stage to comment, well, starting from the story of Prometheus Bound uh, by Aeschylus, um, talk about things like um, resistance, authority, violence, and, and their experience of being part of this city at this time um, of um, turmoil. Uh, another project was uh, a play by um, Greek playwright Dimitris Dimitriadis called Petheno as um, San Hora, the exact uh, translation, the literal translation would be dying as a country which was also a statement about Greece's afflictions and response to those afflictions, historically, um, 
through the ages and how the modern Greek identity is being shaped by those. And it became a, um, a participatory project that um, was formed again by a very uh, big part of Athenian citizens. I can't remember the name. We all had to stand in line and uh, it was part of the um, Athens and Epidaurus festival and feeling that we were all telling a story, each had a line to tell. All had to tell a story uh, that had to do with Greece and its modern identity. So these are like two telling examples, one by a Greek director, um, Mikhail Marmarinos, and the other one by uh, uh, you know, uh, the European Rimini. collective, like Rimini. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of plays whose subject matter is about um, the economic crisis, uh, the um, drain brain, brain drain, Greeks having to leave their country because um, they couldn't, we, we couldn't find a job. I'm a, I'm a, a victim to that myself. I, had, I left Greece in 2012 for Cyprus, which of course uh, had its own history of crisis um, uh, right after. But a lot of Greeks had to leave Greece. Um, the country was deprived of opportunities. Um, people suffered, people committed suicide. Um, there were a lot of, um, a lot of neo-poverty in the streets, homeless people. Um, and I think it's something that made us quite strong to deal with this current crisis, the pandemic. And that's why I feel that we all share a sense of national pride at having done well with the coronavirus, um, staying at home when we were supposed to, wearing a mask when we were supposed to, and pretty much becoming obedient citizens to help each other survive. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible, you know, to say that theater played such a big role and Greeks wearing masks again. In, in a proud way, in a good way, maybe not in that theatrical one, but um, that is stunning that in a moment of real crisis, the financial crisis was as real as it gets the devastation, the numbers of people out of work, I'm sure that we're close to in America, the city or the country turned to theaters that we put money with the Onassis Foundation into theater festivals, that old thousands of year old tradition to uh, find a new identity. Did Greece really find a new identity? Wow, Frank, I mean, that, that question. Um, well, we, I think we've been more at peace with things. In, let's say, in the, recently, in the past couple of years, things seem to take us out of the, the, the heart of uh, the financial crisis, uh, at least, and to some kind of normality. I'm not sure we found uh, a new identity. I think the new identity is um, a, a recognition that we do have a special place in Europe, uh, both geographically, geopolitically, and historically speaking, but also um, the sense that we are part of Europe and we want to be part of Europe. And in fact, we want to be global citizens. So um, the extroversion that occurred in the theater that I spoke of is, I think, part of our new identity. And I'm talking about the younger generations of, of people who feel that their place is very much in Europe. Although, um, truth be told, there were very strong anti-European uh, sentiments during the crisis because we felt that, you know, uh, it was hard for a lot of um, member states of the European Union to understand where we were coming from and, you know, all, all the kinds of stereotypes that people think about Greece. Greeks are lazy, they don't work, they just have sun and souvlaki. Uh, horrible, horrible things um, that for us, um, who had been struggling to find a job, being overqualified, for our parents who... Um, saw their pensions decrease by 40 or 50 percent. Um, those stereotypes were just really out of place. But I think we've come to a new kind of acceptance of um, our unique place. And again, it's, it's very much geopolitical. You can change the fact that you're right there in the Middle East or at the very south of the border. Um, but 
the acceptance is that we, we want to be part of Europe. And I think, I hope we will stay a part of Europe. And I hope Europe is going to be a more, um, uh, not helpful, just helpful, but uh, a better place for the Europeans. Um, and there's going to be more agreement. And I think the coronavirus crisis has helped in that direction, it seems. Uh, that there are ways that Europe is dealing with the problem um, in um, a more united manner, um, which is good, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, how, we, we now, of course, hear less about it because uh, the newspapers, are, of course, are, are full with Corona and now with that, you know, George Floyd's murder. As someone said, how can it be that everything that happens in the world always fits in one paper, you know, in the same amount of pages? So we hear less about the refugees, um, and, uh, the island of Lesbos, and how is the situation and how is the corona situation there? And are theater artists present? Well, the, the peak of the refugee crisis was in uh, 2015, and there were thousands of people arriving on the shores of Lesbos and Kos and Hios, the all, you know, um, in the Aegean Sea. Um, it's a very, very tough um, thing to, to talk about. It really um, creates a lot of pain to think of uh, people being thrown out of their homes my kids in uh, Cyprus go to school with kids who came from Syria um, and Kurdistan, and we know their stories. Uh, so it becomes a, a, a thing that we all live with, and we all have neighbors that are refugees and um, have arrived in Greece from uh, all these troubled regions. Um, most of the, well, a lot of the refugee um, people are locked into refugee camps in different parts of the country, in the mainland of Greece and the islands. So I don't know how this is uh, playing out in terms of the coronavirus. I know that the state is concerned and um, there has been help with, um, you know, the epidemiological team visiting those camps and trying to uh, provide um, help to uh, the people residing there under very, very poor conditions. Uh, things are not good. Uh, I think the best thing about Greece is that um, we are um, also um, a nation of refugees and we've experienced a lot of struggle with that um, many years ago in 1922 when a lot of the Greeks were thrown out of Asia Minor. So we, we, on a personal level, I think most of us do at least try and put ourselves in the refugees' shoes. I, I hope a lot of us do. Um, the state is still very poor. There has been help from the European Union to, to support the infrastructures of the camps, but this is far from ideal. And I think um, there's got to be more solidarity from, from Europe. Um, there's got to be more equal sharing of responsibility because this is a problem that is not just a Greek problem, it's a global problem. And we all need to be equally helpful, equally there to, to support um, those communities. Now, in terms of the theater, as I said, there has been um, a lot of activity revolving around subject matter of the refugee lives and groups working and involving refugees. But as we speak, um, theater artists are very numb because a lot of them are out of work and there's a lot of insecurity about the future. We don't know when theaters will actually be truly operational again. So um, not much is being done to that direction. There isn't much activism to help, um, again, those groups integrate artistically also um, in 
a theater environment. We're just hoping things will get better uh, soon so that the um, exchange of um, ideas, exchange of help, a practical help, uh, will start pouring out again. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Main numbers, space. yeah, numbers um, are quite big of the camps and Europe leaves Greece, and perhaps also in a way Turkey leaves a bit alone uh, because of the geographical closeness, of course, they are affected. Well, because there's no uh, also land border. It's, e it's very easy for certain countries of Europe to just say, I'm putting a wall up and that's it. And no refugee can enter. This is my place. This is our country. We want to keep it pure. We can't just leave people drown in the Aegean. There's no way. We wouldn't do that. But also, like from a logistical point of view, there is a sea border, which is no border, no actual um, strong border. And yes, Turkey has played a part in that as well. But that's a whole different issue. A whole different that, story. Uh, yeah, it is just a, um, for Americans, um, perhaps also not as, uh, as present, but uh, families uh, from Syria and other countries who risk their own lives, the lives of their children to go on small boats uh, overly full to the risk to drown, they, this is still better than staying. And um, mm -hmm. we, as humanity and the, in the history of uh, mankind, we, we have to be on the side of refugees. Um, as Germany, especially the country where I come from, we have a great responsibility also it has done to the world. And I think it uh, tries um, to do it, but I think we all need to understand um, and, and better what it really means, the shockingly no number of the US uh, that were taken in as in 2000 or something like that. from Syria and others uh, compared to a million or a million and a half Germany alone and Turkey, Greece. Um, it is uh, um, a beginning, I think, uh, that we have seen now, maybe one day it all will be, someone will connect all the dots of a, of a world that is that is different. And you yourself as Avra, have you, have you uh, changed little? your work in theater change and tell us a bit what you do. Well, I'm experimenting. I'm trying to use the time to uh, see how we can use new forms. Uh, it's, it's a game, it's an experiment. We don't know where that's going to lead. I mean, there's a lot of mixed media stuff that I find very interesting. And I'm currently working on a new project adapting an, an American short story. Um, in a mixed media manner. You, uh, it's called the yellow wa um, wallpaper. And it's about a woman who is isolated in her home and she starts having hallucinations. But it turns out it's not that um, she's crazy, but she is being um, fed certain ideas about her life and um, about herself. But I, I like the idea of um, using the motif of isolation to create something that um, uh, uses animation and um, mixes with um, storytelling through voiceovers and not having actual actors uh, on stage. More like a little film, uh, so to speak. I like to use technology a lot. Um, has my work changed? I think, as I said at the beginning, uh, it will change. It will become more political. I, I already feel the, the kind of the urgency to move to that direction. To, to more political in what sense? With use more of... involving, more involving of the community in some sense, less um, aestheticized in, in another sense, um, more about um, being an outspoken statement or um, a work that um, creates connections with people from different parts of the world. I, I've already um, started talking to people from uh, other places and I've worked with people from Turkey and from Iran and um, obviously, you know, a lot of Western countries. I think in connections and intercultural exchange is our future. That's the only way we can understand the other. And that's the only way we can stop things like the murder of George Floyd. Um, because ultimately the, what the pandemic has done is 
um, acted as a catalyst to make us see that we're all human beings who are very vulnerable, all equally vulnerable, and all um, needing to come together to, to you know, to tackle the, the huge um, inequities of the world, injustice, uh, poverty. And don't, I do think that theater has a place in, in that, in making those uh, statements clear and raising the voices of people in putting up the, the, the questions. And yes, we are uh, going through a tragedy, but Aristotle said that tragedy is about understanding cause and effect because it does lead to a recognition and recognition leads to some kind of knowledge and self-knowledge. So something good is meant to come out of this in some respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good uh, way to think about it, to see the cause and structures that cause or are connected to it that we're not able to prevent it um, to have uh, such a... Um, do you feel that, uh, that, that really a uh, hard, hard crisis, most probably no European country or Western kind of went through that crisis as Greece did. Do you feel it is in a better place now because of the crisis? Or do you think without the crisis, it would have found its way? This is one of the best questions that have ever been posed with respect to the crisis? I don't know. Um, I think it has made us, the, the financial crisis has made Greeks very resilient. Um, again, it created a kind of solidarity amongst Greeks um, and especially the younger generations. Uh, it made us look to the future to see how we can uh, you know, survive in, in this universe that for many years, for at least seven to eight years, seemed extremely hostile to us, to the country. I'm not sure uh, we are the better place. Obviously, like um, Greece was doing pretty well right before the crisis struck, what with the Olympics and a lot of, you know, um, European infrastructure and European um, money coming into the country. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs and, and their income, but um, because I, I, I'm usually an optimist, I think maybe what it has done is um, um, to, uh, besides making us more resistant and resilient, as I said, is to make us see um, that we can survive without a lot of money. We can survive without being rich we, we can still have a good life and find meaning in things like friendship um strong connection making art at a small budget it's all possible so that's that's good you can build on that um yeah but that's speaking for uh, again the younger generations it's very it's been very hard for um my parents generation who saw their income fall, as I said, by maybe by 50%. Uh, and um, a lot of people were driven to poverty. But for the younger generations, we are um, now um, more aware of what our position in Europe is and um, what kind of solidarity is needed to, to create the circumstances um, for improvement uh, on a social level, on a financial level, on, you know, an artistic level. Um, we're more connected to each other. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking as an artist mostly mm -hmm. in this respect. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it seems the Greek state at the moment has done, um, has taken some steps, some um, um, measures to make things viable in the next few months, because of course theaters um, uh, closed in mid-March and a lot of people became unemployed, but there has been uh, support from uh, the government. I think it's about uh, 800 euros um, per month for those employed 
in the mm -hmm. arts, in the cultural sector, and were forced to, you know, uh, quit their jobs. Uh, but also there have been uh, other actions that the Ministry of Culture has announced. Uh, for example, there will be um, a lot of um, artistic and cultural events in um, over 200, I think, um, archaeological sites in Greece in the summer, because open air is the safest option, obviously, and we, we do have to take advantage of the cultural heritage. So a lot of things, a lot of um, different initiatives will take place in the archaeological sites of Greece. Um, the state subsidies uh, for small theater companies are doubling for 2020, and the period of implementation of this amount of money will be extended. So there have been um, little things that are happening that are not going to solve, obviously, the problem um, there and then, but are definitely going to help the landscape look less dismal than it could look um, in a different environment. I think um, uh, most Greek um, artists feel that we're at a good place um, because the government shows some respect. Um, and one of the biggest grievances that was uh, holding both Greeks and Cypriots um, captive in the realm of uh, culture was that um, art was not treated as a profession, it was just treated as a hobby. And I'm sure this is happening in other parts of the world as well. So what is happening in the two countries at the moment is um, a, a way, uh, a new system of implementing a so-called registry of cultural bodies and individuals that will kind of um, bring in everybody who has been employed professionally or semi-professionally in the culture sector in Greece and Cyprus uh, so that people will be covered financially for um, a part of the losses they incurred when they lost their jobs because of the coronavirus. So that's also very important. And that's also something that brought the artists together. Mm -hmm. This is a, in a wonderful way that somehow Greece is recognizing the contribution the artist community has done during the financial crisis and that also the artists cared about the community and their country and, and that it is uh, being honored. Um, it sounds uh, monthly payments, it sounds almost a paradisical, um, idenic uh, to, uh, to, to us here. Just a few days ago, the Metropolitan Opera announced they will not show anything till the end of the year, maybe a New Year's fundraiser. Uh, artists haven't been paid even at the opera since March. Uh, European theaters kept on paying um, and every mm -hmm. freelanced artist, every independent co-experimental artist who already struggles so hard to work, it's a disastrous <clears throat> and, uh, and a terrible setting. And I think um, there's something to learn from. I think also artists has, we have really uh, helped the city to come back in the 70s. Hilary Miller's book about New York City and the arts makes a good point how much that has changed. Everybody left artist state, artists invented and made the place a way to do it. And maybe we have to think again how also New York City um, needs a celebration in the sense of festivals like, like you uh, put out. And uh, so this is interesting to hear what solutions you found, what you work and that actually then artists also in a country that struggles so hard now found, found a way, but it tells also a bigger story that something is working again. And um, and it's uh, <clears throat> something to um, to really um, take into account, and uh, and I think uh, we must uh, all look also outside, you know, from the American uh, work uh, way of working, living, and producing art um, to to find answers that things that could work and will make a difference. Uh, many of our talks. It came up uh, the idea to look back at uh, mythical stories, um, whether it was um, um, Indian uh, a puppet uh, um, um, and players, you know, Anna Rupa Roy, whether it was just yesterday uh, Bruce Kanner, so I'm looking at Hebrew myth, um, Chris Vadong, who talked about mythical stories of the uh, Inuit uh, population. Um, a Brazilian colleague so that we're looking at Latin American mythical uh, plays. Um, of course, Greek is the mythical plays, the myths that are told. Um, have, have that played a role uh, 
or was it more, as you said, it's a new work, like the, the Rimini Protocol inspired, Milo Rao inspired, reworking, adapting. So what, what worked? For the longest time, we uh, Greek artists have felt it was a responsibility to stage the big classics, the big Greek works. So I think every self-respecting artist had to take on one of the tragedies. And there is a very troubled relationship that we have with our past, um, a sense of guilt, a sense of awe. Um, at the same time, because we are, uh, as I said, at a very transitional space, a liminal space where we are redefining our um, identity as artists in Europe and the world. Um, there's been a desire to kind of um, deconstruct many of those plays and uh, deconstruct the stories. And that has informed, uh, I think, um, the greatest part of the last decade of the 20th century and maybe the beginning of the 21st, but now it's more about something else. I think now um, without um, disrespecting or ignoring the, the Greek plays or the Greek myths, I think most um, younger artists are involved in the new stories, that the identity of modern Greece which is a very different thing altogether. It, it, it's, it's, it feels very um, a far cry from our you know, glorious past into a country in turmoil um, that has had to go through a lot of um, shit, if you forgive my expression, from um, the world. So there is a lot of um, desire to, to create new stories. Um, not necessarily adapt um, the Greeks. That has been happening and the, uh, obviously as a matter of course, the Athens and Epidaurus festival always stages a couple of Greek tragedies every year. So that is in the agenda, it still holds in the agenda. But even if we adapt uh, from the Greeks, it's usually like things like monologues, um, uh, mixed media plays, uh, I myself worked on a, um, the myth of Hippolytus and Phaedra in um, a production that I staged in London last year in 2019, which used a lot of um, uh, video mapping to create um, visually the absent roles um, that were in conversation with Phaedra. So I used that more as an excuse, um, although I love the story, uh, to experiment with form, uh, because th there's something beautiful about those plays that are um, open to so many different interpretations and directions, and that's why they have survived through the centuries. But speaking about Greek, modern Greek productions now, um, the ones that make it to the National Theatre or the Onassis uh, Stegi, I think um, there's plays about um, how Greeks deal with um, leaving their country, um, about the influx of the refugees. One of the most successful experiments was um, um, production by um, Anestis Azaz. He is, uh, he's worked in Germany a lot, so you might have heard of him. Um, and Prodromos uh, Tsinikoris, they did a play, uh, called Clean City, which used the stories of the cleaning ladies working from different parts of um, the world, not just Europe, but other places too, who have made a living in Athens. And the, those people were actually on stage, you know, amateur uh, performers telling their stories um, in Greek. It was an extremely moving um, production. And I think that's the kind of thing that you know, who can identify with at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's also very, very interesting. And so it's the stories of today. I also like the idea of the government or whoever is in charge to say, let's go back to archeological sites, but make new stories. Um, that idea to go back to a history, connect to it about, you know, create something that perhaps is not a karaoke version. Um, I think Milo Rao talked about that when he said, you know, why do we do karaoke? 
often is not as good as the original. Why don't we do something new? We I think have to sing our own song, as mm -hmm. Robert Wilson often um, um, said that everybody wanted to sing. And they said, like Barbara Streisand, he said, sing your own song. Um, also reminds me of the I, Arthur Nozisiel who talked with us from the Sita and Rans um, and their contribution during the Zoom Corona time uh, was uh, to engage with a book by Patrick Boucheron, a French historian who wrote the history of France, but seen as a history outside the national focus, but really said that it, France always was a country of immigration, always was a country open to influences, always imported things, always people moved in and threw it out and to remind people out of the centuries of this and they reenacted or read um, some of that, that things. And I think this is uh, also something perhaps what could work uh, for the Americans to really look back the country of um, the history of racism, the history of struggle for freedom, liberties, and what it offered a unique uh, opportunity. So um, that is quite, quite stunning. What, so did, in the time you spend in your Corona time, uh, were there books, uh, music, paintings? Was there something what you, it inspired you that you connected to on a very deep level? Uh -huh the stories of the people all over the world. I, I had no desire for big literature, so to speak, and I'm embarrassed to say that, but I, uh, I really devoured everything that was um, about people suffering in, in Brazil, in, um, in London, um, in New York. So that, that became uh, my daily focus. Um, the, the internet became a hub of emotions and uh, it became an eternal and um, always alive now of things. So uh, I wasn't, I, I wasn't, I mean, I was reading through um, a lot of uh, things about tragedy and um, Terry Eagleton's sweet violence. And also one of the things that made um, a big impression on me was Judith Butler's Precarious Life, Lives, um, in which she talks about what makes a life uh, grievable and what lives are worth, um, um, uh, are worth uh, um, living and what is uh, our position um, as you know, citizens to what, uh, violence does to people and who deserves to die, who deserves to live. So I think that that was something that I would single out of my reading experience. But uh, as I said, mostly it was about reading reports from what was happening um, globally at the time and uh, especially Italy, especially the first part, the, the first month of the, the pandemic. Uh, I was about to travel to uh, Bologna and a couple of um, days before my um, uh, trip for a conference, uh, the Northern Italy went on a lockdown, so everything was canceled. And I have a lot of friends living in um, Bologna, in Verona and in Milan. So we, we talk about this um, crisis every day. Um, and that I would connect to my readings on tragedy and uh, yeah. As I said, Terry Eagleton, Judith Butler, uh, these were definitely big thinkers of the century mm -hmm. and what we're going through now. But going back to what you said about revisiting the past, I think there is, this is a solution for America, for Greece, for, you know, most countries, in fact, to, to make that bridge, that connection between past and present. And um, we learn from the past, but then we change in the present. And I think this is what theater can also do to return to um, those stories, those forms, those archetypes, they're very important. And use uh, the wisdom and um, the universals of the archetypes and transform them into daily, modern day uh, life, modern day conditions, modern day struggles. 
um, I, I think for Greeks especially, this has a, a, a very particular value. We need to get rid of that, um, on the one hand, nostalgia for our glorious past that no longer is, but at the same time, um, reconnect with it on some different level uh, that would allow us to move on through history, feeling um, independent and worthy of something. There were times during the financial crisis when um, being bombarded with those horrible impressions that the world had about Greeks, we felt that um, maybe there is a truth to that. We question ourselves and I think we're beyond that now. And having that sense of connection to our past is important, but also being able to carve out a future that goes different ways. Coming closer to the end of our um, of our um, conversation, and really, um, thank you for sharing. It is important to hear uh, us from you or from Greece, from a country that went through deep, very very dangerous existential crisis, and that's something that's in front of us. So, and to hear what happened, what worked, and uh, what came out of it. Um, yeah, I know you also teach. Um, so what do you say to young artists, uh, to artists in general, um, maybe also artists right now who see the images of uh, George Floyd repeatedly on the streets, the demonstrations, and how, what do we do? Um, uh, what, how, what are we, how are we supposed to engage with this world to create meaning? And um, what did Corona teach you? What do you tell a young, artist who comes to you to, in your class and says, you know, what's, I'm, work, the world is uncertain. I don't, I'm not fully sure how and what to do. What is important to focus on? Emotions and be unapologetic about expressing them on stage. So much of um, the theater's malaise, I would call it, has been about formalism and empty formalism often. And, um, we need to go past that and engage with our emotions and engage the audience through the emotions. And I think that's the only way um, we will uh, survive this pandemic as artists, because we have experienced a lot during the pandemic. There has been a lot of pain. Uh, thankfully, I, well, so far, I don't know of um, any people personally, but one who, who, died from the coronavirus and the country wasn't as much afflicted but um, I know that a lot of other countries have suffered a, a great deal of, of pain and we must be bold about expressing the pain um, it can be a violent cry it can be a different uh, kind of um, writing that is disruptive and that is uh, revolutionary it can be a manifesto put on stage, but um, we should shy away from um, creating spectacles and turn back to making theater. That's mm. what I tell my students. Be bold, be daring, and um, don't apologize mm -hmm. for being passionate. To go away from the spectacle, from the big thousand seat shows, um, to deal with emotions and not just the feelings, the emotions that underlie um, um, the feelings. I mean, that's a very, very good advice and valuable also for us, for me, and I'm also sure for, for our listeners and to get in touch with these emotions. So um, I think there was, there was a truly um, eye-opening and um, also the question of Europe, of course, Greece, for you even thinking, are we, we want to be part of Europe, are we Europe, Europe didn't want us and uh, and there's a big question, of course, of the European Union. It's founded on economic uh, uh, ideas. And I think many have said early on, uh, one politician, Habsburg, said that you cannot find found as a group of states on an economic uh, um, premise. If the economy will go down, this will fall apart. The ideas of nations are based on a French Revolution or the American Revolution. Um, or mythical stories of states itself. And um, Foucault suggested, if I remember that right, he said, you know, what really is the Western world? 
who are we, what are our ideals, how do we go from it. He does talk about the Odyssey, about Ulysses, the stories, people who know these stories, we interpret them, we are close to them. And this is um, the history in a way of a Western world in there, perhaps later on the Arthurian myths that King Arthur had the uh, 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 the knights around the table and everybody has to be on its own and to kill the dragons and come back and talk about it. But I think the, the, the stories um, that came out there are with us, even if they are newly interpreted or directly connected. And it is uh, what gives us um, the ideas of a democracy of enlightenment and theater has been part of the struggle of that complex struggle and that complex history of freedoms and the history of liberties. And we have to be part of it. And uh, also the theater community in the United States um, We'll have to rethink, as you all did, um, what to do. And I think the advice you got from the theater makers to say, engage with communities, go out. I think you wish that they dragged them in and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and to, in, to include them, have the people, the cleaning ladies of themselves there. And uh, the people from Athens were in the Great Remini project. And I think Daniel Wenzel talked a lot about it. Um, when he came to the Siegel. So these are, they are real possibilities. And also, if I understand right from you, theater and performance had a crucial impact on um, that uh, dealing with the moment finding meeting. And now also the state finds way to, to show its grace and uh, thankfulness to artists in that time um, of Corona. So this is a truly um, a, a great contribution. Thank you for taking the time for talking to us. It was um, so uh, beautifully presented and uh, I think it's going to make me think a lot and um, also somehow some uh, positive uh, news or some uh, things that perhaps could be part of a toolbox, you know, to, to mm -hmm. address that situation here. So really, thank you for that. Tomorrow we have um, Ashley uh, Taylor with us, a young director actually also coming out of the Columbia School. I think you also came out of that. We had Ellen Bogart here with us and uh, Ashley was directing Carol Churchill's uh, Mad Forest, a play, perhaps the best play about the uprisings in Eastern Europe, the killings on the streets, uh, demonstrations, police, families who were divided by uh, um, that deep split in the society and she was faced, uh, should we stop the rehearsal and just go home? Do we find to do something with it? Gideon Lister invited her, Gideon at uh, Bard College and said, whatever you do, and we will pay you, which is wonderful. And she said, let's find a way. And together with computer coders and some software engineers, she created a way to have a live performance and almost in the sense of a graphic novel that was a piece of art, I thought. And it's perhaps a one way to um, also uh, address the situation. And I think they're also thinking about giving workshops, how to use that uh, software, especially small companies, and because it is of significance that we find ways that theater artists mm -hmm. can work, that they're employed, that they make money and that they continue um, uh, and, and their work and their mission. And it now also really shows who wants to do theater. Commercial theater has shut down, uh, but many people are engaging deeply and um, as you also did. So again, thank you so much. So tune in tomorrow for um, other and then next week, uh, again, please do join us for Jonathan McCrory and, uh, and the National Black Sea, Tamila, uh, James, Nigel, Woody, and, and, and everybody, and also the great uh, Jean-Luc Nancy. I, uh, it's a big honor for us to have him here, and uh, he will talk, I think, about art. It's an open conversation also, art and the times of corona and in the times of... Uh, uprising and so uh, thank you uh, thanks for our listeners to stick with us we again went a little bit over time and for how run for hosting us every day uh, there's this wonderful Thea, vj and travis my seagull team andy and uh, sam young and of course to the viewers for really for taking time for listen to artists from around the world this is important that they also have an audience but it's also important for us because what artists go through their experience uh, the meaning they find um, they have been on the right side of social justice, on the right side of history, early on, always. And I think so we should really and have to listen to them. And uh, so Ava, you were part of that. Thank you so much. And uh, to our viewers, uh, stay safe, stay tuned, join us tomorrow if you can. And of course, next week is a very important and significant uh, a week and what's happening now on the streets in America is of significance. It's something that is changing or maybe things already have changed. Revolutions start when things perhaps already have changed. And uh, 
So, but we have to work for it. So thank you and uh, goodbye. Thank you, bye -bye. Frank. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.